Thanks for the introduction and for, in general, following what I requested. So I don't want anyone to leave this room today thinking that surgery is the answer for metastatic soft tissue sarcoma. Unfortunately, for the vast majority of patients, surgery is not an option. But in a small subset of carefully selected patients, surgery may help. But again, the issue is careful patient selection predicated upon an, un an in-depth understanding of the patient's disease biology. And by the way, that gentleman on the top of the screen is, uh, is Roger Williams. So here are the take-home points, um, and I'll start with these so you keep them in mind throughout the talk. Resection of sarcoma metastases, again, only in carefully selected patients. I can't say this enough. Surgery is not the answer for this problem in the vast majority of patients, and we need better options. And, and I'm going to finish my talk with what I hope may be a better option for these patients. If you're going to resect the soft tissue sarcoma metastasis or metastases, it needs to be integrated with other therapeutic modalities, and that decision needs to be made in a multidisciplinary fashion, another key concept that everyone should leave here with. And again, as Dr. Brennan started with and as many of the speakers emphasized, the outcome following resection is more dependent on the inherent biology of the tumor rather than the technique or the surgeon. And here's the outline for the talk, and I'll use this slide to break up the sections. First, we're going to talk about the risk factors for metastases in patients with sarcoma and the patterns of spread. So if you're going to treat sarcoma metastases, you have to find them. And if you're going to find them, you need to know how to look for them. And to do that, you need to understand the risk factors. For extremity soft tissue sarcoma, the vast majority of tumors that metastasize are, in fact, high grade. So low grade tumors are much less likely to spread than high grade tumors. Deep tumors are more likely to spread, and tumor size also predicts metastases. And again, these are all surrogates of tumor biology and allow us to predict who is more likely to develop metastases. With retroperitoneal sarcoma, overall, about 20% develop metastases at five years. That varies greatly by which type of tumor and subset you look at. But as Dr. Gladdy mentioned, local recurrence is the real problem with this disease. High-grade tumors are much more likely to metastasize, as is the case with extremity sarcoma. And incomplete resection is associated with metastases. And this is another point about tumor biology. Incomplete resection does not mean that the surgeon didn't know how to do the operation. It may, but not necessarily. An incomplete resection often occurs when we're unable to remove the entire tumor due to invasion of critical structures that we can't remove. Again, a surrogate of aggressive behavior. And with GIST, a mitotic rate, size, and location of the primary tumor predict the likelihood of metastases. And so in terms of the sites of sarcoma metastases, again, it varies um, with the primary tumor site. For extremity soft tissue sarcoma, the vast majority of metastases end up in the lung with a very small number at other sites. With retroperitoneal sarcoma, more of a balance between liver and lung. And for visceral GI sarcomas, which are nearly all GIST, the predominant site of metastases involves the liver and the peritoneal cavity. And to summarize uh, the metastasis data in a pictorial form, so for an extremity sarcoma, again, the predominant site is the lung. For retroperitoneal sarcoma, the, uh, there's a more of a mix between lung and liver um, with a slight predominance in the lung. And for GIST, and let's just call this a gastric GIST, the most common sites of metastatic spread are the liver and the peritoneal cavity. So now let's consider individual sites of metastatic disease that occur in sarcoma patients. So liver metastases, again, um, account for a minority of all sarcoma metastases, about 17 percent, but again, that varies with primary site. Sarcoma liver metastases most commonly come from visceral primaries, and again, those are mainly GIST. And as I just mentioned, GIST is the most common source of sarcoma liver metastases. The majority of the tumors that metastasize are high grade. Again, grade is a very important predictor of how likely a tumor is to spread. And unfortunately, uh, most patients that develop liver metastases are not candidates for surgery. And a big, a big reason why is that nearly 75% present with multifocal bilobar disease. So this is not something that can be treated surgically. And again, the outcome is going to be dictated by the behavior of the tumor, not what we can or cannot do as surgeons. And as tumors um, become more advanced and spread, the features of the primary tumor are not um, 
completely un unimportant, but their prognostic influence is much less um, compared to a patient with primary disease only. In terms of lung metastases, uh, the majority of all sarcoma metastases uh, do, in fact, end up in the lung. For extremity soft tissue sarcoma, again, the vast majority are in the lung with very few in the liver. 23% of patients with extremity soft tissue sarcoma do develop lung metastases, but again, that varies greatly um, by grade, size, and depth, and primary tumor feature is less important. And the survival curve is showing you the difference in, in survival between patients who had a complete resection and an incomplete resection. Patients that have a complete resection do better. And again, that is not because they necessarily had a better operation, but that's because they had more favorable biology enabling the surgeon to do a complete resection. I know the surgeons at this institution, and they're pretty good, so they know what they're doing. It's about tumor biology, not the technique. Sarcoma nodal metastases, um, as Dr. Brennan mentioned, very, very rare event. Fewer than 3% of patients with soft tissue sarcoma develop nodal metastases. But if you look at all the patients that have nodal metastases, so that's 46 patients, 45 of 46, or 98%, had high-grade tumors. So again, patients with high-grade primary tumors are much more likely to develop metastases. Of patients that had, and most of the patients that had nodal metastases actually had isolated nodal metastases, so they did not have any other sites of disease. But this is such a rare event that there's really no role for staging the lymphatic basins in patients with extremity soft tissue sarcoma. So sentinel lymph node mapping um, is a popular technique for melanoma and Merkel cell carcinoma, but we never do it for soft tissue sarcoma. If something's apparent clinically, then further investigation is warranted. And the types of sarcoma that most often spread to lymph nodes, angiosarcoma, epithelioid sarcoma, and rhabdomyosarcoma. And looking at sites of primary disease, extremity sarcoma are more likely to spread to lymph nodes, mainly lower extremity compared to upper extremity. Now, one thing that you need to do is, if you're giving a talk in a room where your boss is sitting at the table across from you, you have to cite one of his papers. <laughs> and this also highlights the power of the Memorial Sloan Kettering database, because you can't study such a rare event, such as sarcoma brain metastases, which is extraordinarily infrequent, without a very robust database with nearly 9,000 patients. Uh, but just a bit about brain metastases and sarcoma. So again, take home message, rarely happens, very rare. 40 of 3,800 patients developed brain metastases, so well less than 1%. Lyomyosarcoma and liposarcoma, most common. And in most of these patients, they had a previous site of metastatic disease, and that was most commonly the lung. Um, when this happens, as you can tell by looking at these survival curves, um, it's a very bad event. Median survival of seven months. And again, resections associated with survival. So if you look at these Kaplan-Meier curves, well, they're both, they're both dismal. But there's a difference between the patients that had surgery and those who did not. Does this mean the surgery helped these patients? We can't say that. What this definitely means is that these patients, although they had very bad biology, slightly better than these patients. So again, that's the key point. The way these tumors are inherently designed, if you will, to behave is what dictates how these patients are going to do ultimately. So in order to decide what we're going to do with patients with metastatic sarcoma, we need to define the extent of disease in order to select them properly for surgery or not. So I use a fingerprint here because, you know, when I think about cancer and I think about sarcoma, every tumor is different. Every patient's different. Every tumor is going to act a little bit differently. And we categorize things. And with sarcoma, as you've heard, 50 to 100 subtypes, and it's even more complicated than that. But everybody's tumor is going to behave a little bit differently. So you have to consider the biologic surrogates that we've discussed in the context of the patient in front of you, their physiologic status to determine whether or not they're candidates for surgery. And that involves, again, the histologic subtype, the grade, the size, the nature and tempo of disease progression. You've heard the term disease-free interval today. So that's the time frame between which the patient's diagnosed with the primary tumor to when they develop metastases. And in general, when that happens quickly, we consider that to be a sign of more aggressive tumor biology. So patients that have a longer lag between the primary tumor and the metastatic tumor tend to do better. Again, a surrogate for tumor biology. And the metastatic tumor features are important as well when evaluating these patients. Not surprisingly, patients with more metastases do worse, and patients with multiple sites of involvement do worse as well. Uh, one slide on imaging. Um, you've heard a little bit about this today. 
In general, uh, we use CT scans to look for lung metastases, CT or MRI for the liver. Um, MRI is particularly helpful for extremity sites, CT for the retroperitoneum. And as you've heard, PET plays a limited role in this disease. Um, when you do use it, it's more sensitive for high-grade tumors compared to low-grade tumors. And in some cases, it's an alternative for assessing disease response to systemic therapy, but CT scans are pretty good at this as well. So we don't use this much, but if you're going to use it, you should understand its limitations, mainly low-grade tumors are unlikely to be picked up by PET. So principles of resection and outcomes. So again, when managing patients with sarcoma metastases or metastatic disease from any organ, you have to assess the disease biology, and again, disease-free interval, the tempo of the disease, the histology, and the overall disease burden. You need to consider the feasibility of the resection and its potential impact on the patient. Uh, if a patient has a small tumor on the left side of the liver, that may be easy to do. I'm more willing to do that in the right patient. Um, but if someone has a tumor in the central part of the liver requiring more than two-thirds of their liver to be removed, then I'm much less likely to do that because I'm much more likely to hurt the patient than to help them. The physiologic status of the patient is incredibly important if you're going to subject them to an operation for metastatic disease. And again, if you're going to consider surgery for metastases, it needs to be integrated with other therapeutic modalities. And the best example of this is GIST. And the availability of an effective systemic therapy for GIST has perhaps expanded the indications for surgery in some of these patients because they can't experience prolonged survival after an operation if they have one. And as Dr. Brennan always teaches us, the more important question than can we do it is should we do it? And this is how we try to make these decisions. So in terms of some of the outcomes following resections of metastatic disease, very important point that most patients, even after a complete resection, will recur. That's important to keep in mind. Survival after re-resection, 36% at five years, which isn't terrible when you consider uh, where we were with colorectal cancer liver metastases not too long ago. And again, these are carefully, very carefully selected patients. Complete resection is critical. Again, not only dependent on the technique and the surgeon, but the biology of the tumor. And the prognostic factors we think are important include the number of tumors, the size of the largest tumor, the primary tumor grade, but as I mentioned, the primary tumor primary tumor features aren't as important once metastases have developed. And again, tempo of disease, disease-free interval. These themes just keep popping up. Properly selected patients should undergo pulmonary resection, but again, most patients will not be eligible for that. And again, we see the difference in outcome when comparing patients with a longer disease-free interval to a shorter disease-free interval and grade. Low-grade patients do much better than those with high-grade tumors. And uh, one last slide on pulmonary metastases. Again, to review the most common site, liposarcoma is the most common source of metastases, and the median overall survival, again, an R0 resection, which means a complete resection, 33 months, better than an incomplete resection, R1 or R2, 16 months, no resection, those people do worse, and again, that's because they weren't eligible for surgery, not simply because they didn't have surgery. And again, the longer disease-free interval is associated with improved outcome. So a little bit about liver metastases. And again, you have to consider the disease burden and the extent of the operation that you're going to do to determine its potential impact on the patient, good, bad, and potentially both. So here are four sarcoma liver metastases. And just taking a quick look at the liver, if you're not a liver surgeon, you might think, well, these are pretty easy to take out, do a little wedge resection, no big deal. Patient goes home in a couple days. This one, maybe you have to take out the gallbladder. Nobody misses that, right? And this is right over the portal area, so that one's a little tricky. But if you look inside the liver, um, and you need to do this as a liver surgeon, you understand why some of these resections are actually potentially quite morbid, and you have to consider that very carefully in the context of a limited potential benefit. So this tumor is actually pretty straightforward to remove. We could probably do that laparoscopically. A patient would go home in a, or in a day or two. So in a patient that had a 36-month disease-free interval, um, no other sites of disease, no effective uh, systemic therapy available, I might consider doing that. But these other tumors are a lot more involved, okay? This tumor is right by the right hepatic vein and middle hepatic vein. This may require an extended right hepatectomy, removing more than half the liver. Um, very, very difficult for me to justify that in most patients with metastatic sarcoma. 
This one's right over the right portal pedicle. So this is the blood supply and the bile drainage from the right side of the liver. To take out that tumor, you'd have to take out the whole right side of the liver. And this is one on the left. So you have to appreciate the extent of what you're gonna do to the patient to decide if it's worthwhile and if you can justify it. Now, if you look at outcomes um, from patients undergoing liver resection from metastatic sarcoma, again, you know, these themes keep coming up. Disease biology dictates how these patients do. Longer disease-free interval, time between primary and first metastasis is a predictor of outcome, just like with lung metastases. In a study from uh, Ron DiMatteo at Memorial Sloan Kettering, they looked at 56 patients who underwent resection, median disease-free survival of 32 months, five-year survival, disease-free survival of 20%. And again, the factors that went into patient selection, 80% of patients had metachronous disease, that means that the metastases occurred after the primary, and in general, they had longer disease-free intervals, the patients that did go to the operating room. As I mentioned earlier, GIST is the most common source of sarcoma liver metastases, so not surprisingly, nearly two-thirds of the patients in this study did, in fact, have GIST, and 50% of them were less than 50 years old. You're more likely to subject a younger patient who's healthier to an operation like this than you would an older, sicker patient. And again, predictors of outcome, metachronous disease, and disease-free interval. And here's another Kaplan-Meier curve showing you that patients who undergo surgery for metastases do better than patients who don't. But I'm going to keep repeating myself. This doesn't mean that everybody with liver metastases should have surgery. That's not the conclusion that you should draw from this curve. This means that the patients selected for surgery did better. Maybe the surgery helped, but I can tell you that the disease biology was the key factor. Um, another slide on nodal metastases. Again, this is very rare, less than 3% of patients. I already mentioned the subtypes, and I'm just showing you the same slide for a different situation. Patients that have a curative lymphadenectomy do better than those who don't, but again, that's more about what can be done than what actually was done technically. So patients with better biology do better, although the surgery may help, the biology is the dominating factor. So management of just metastases, um, this is an evolving area. Um, it's an exciting area, mainly because of the availability of an effective systemic agent. It allows us to do more as surgeons. But again, um, picking which patients you operate on is critical. And we actually use the response to the systemic agent to determine which patients may or may not benefit from surgery. Another study from Memorial Sloan Kettering, Dr. DiMatteo. So in patients that were treated with imatinib prior to surgery, based upon the response, we get an idea of which patients are more likely to survive long-term after surgery. So patients with responsive disease, so their tumors demonstrate shrinkage or necrosis after treatment with imatinib, they're more likely to survive long-term after surgery. And patients with focal resistance um, have a relatively favorable outcome, both compared to patients with multifocal resistance whose GIST metastases are not responding to the therapy. So when I see a patient with multifocal resistance, um, very, very unlikely that I'm going to consider surgery in this patient because I know that there's such a high chance that they're going to recur at a short interval after surgery, so they're not going to benefit from it. As opposed to the patient who has tumors that are responsive to imatinib, it makes more sense to operate on that patient because they're more likely to experience a prolonged disease-free interval after the operation. Um, this slide was covered previously, so I'll skip over this. Now, what do we do with the barn when the horse is left? Do you need to take out the primary tumor in a patient who comes to you with synchronous disease, meaning they have a primary sarcoma in the extremity of the retroperitoneum, and they have metastases diagnosed at presentation? Well, as surgical oncologists and oncologists in general, you know, we recognize that once a patient's developed metastases, you're not going to confer any survival benefit. You're not going to help the patient live longer by taking out the primary tumor because the key determinant of survival for that patient at that point is the metastatic disease. That doesn't mean we never remove primary tumors in the setting of metastatic disease, but the reasoning behind it is different. We'll consider removing those tumors if the tumor is causing symptoms, um, limiting function of the patient, quality of life, and if you can anticipate that the patient's going to recover well from surgery, so younger, fitter patients, and a favorable pattern and limited extent of metastases. So, We'll consider resection of a symptomatic primary tumor if the patient um, has a limited metastatic disease burden such that we can expect them to have a reasonable survival time after the operation. Otherwise, it doesn't make much sense. So 
So a, br a brief word about uh, non-surgical options. Um, on occasion, um, a surgical procedure may be too morbid for a patient or the disease too extensive, but they're still candidates for uh, local therapy or regional therapy. So radiofrequency or microwave ablation is something else that, be, that can be considered. Uh, very limited data on this. Um, we're not quite sure how this uh, fits into the paradigm of managing sarcoma metastases, but if we extrapolate what we know about ablation with other diseases, it makes sense in certain situations. And whether you when you decide to do this or not, the same uh, factors go in as when you're considering a surgical procedure. You consider the patient, bio the patient biology and the tumor biology. Um, just like surgery, you're limited by the size of the lesions and their location. And just like with surgery, the outcome's ultimately going to be dictated by the biology of the disease and the availability or not of effective systemic agents. This slide is a study from Johns Hopkins um, comparing resection in patients with liver metastases versus resection plus ablation. Um, so the simple conclusion to draw would be that surgery is better than ablation, but again, that's not, that's not as simple as that because these patients were selected to have surgery. They had less extensive disease, so that explains the spread between these two curves. Um, at this bottom slide, they compared patients um, with GIST who were treated with imatinib to patients who had other types of sarcoma. The patients who were treated with uh, imatinib who had GIST did better than patients with other types of sarcoma. Again, not because they had better ablations and better surgery, but because of the better systemic agent that's available for those tumors. Uh, a study from Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, Drs. Maluccio and DiMatteo and Brown um, looked at the role of embolization uh, for sarcoma liver metastases. Again, this isn't used often, but for patients that have a very extensive disease burden in the liver with otherwise relatively favorable factors, um, it's something to consider. And 60% of the patients in the study had a radiographic response rate. The rationale here is that the metastatic tumors derive most of their blood supply from the hepatic arterial system, so the embolic agents are injected into the arterial system, and therefore they mainly go to the tumor as opposed to the normal liver parenchyma. So if I've convinced you of anything today, it's that surgery is not enough for patients with metastatic sarcoma. I'm a surgeon, I like to operate, but I have to admit that this is not the answer. So what else can we do? Well, the Kristin Ann Carr Fund um, is supporting research in our lab um, where we're trying to develop new forms of therapy for, for gastrointestinal stromal tumor. And um, I want to take this opportunity again to thank the Kristin and Carr Fund for supporting our lab and for supporting our work and for all, for all the other things they do for sarcoma patients. And so I'm going to spend a couple minutes telling you about the project that they're funding because I think it's fascinating. And Dr. Mackey actually gave you a little introduction to designer T-cells earlier today. And so I asked my wife, how should I explain a designer T-cell to this crowd? And this was her idea. But it's, it's actually a little bit different. So what we do in the lab and what Steve Rosenberg has been doing at the NIH for many years and others, Michelle Satellane at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we take T cells and then using a retroviral system, we get the T cells to express receptors that enable them to recognize specific molecules on the tumors. Unfortunately, most sarcomas don't have these easy targets. But GIST is a good model for this type of system because most of the GIST tumors express the KIT protein. So what we're doing in the lab is we're getting the T cells to express an anti-KIT receptor, which we call a CAR, chimeric antigen receptor. In this case, um, it's a little bit unique. Traditionally, what people do when they make designer T cells is they link a portion of an antibody or a T cell receptor to the T cell receptor signaling apparatus. In this case, we actually took the ligand for KIT, KIT ligand or stem cell factor, and cloned that to the T cell receptor signaling machinery. We have first generation designer T cells which we made that are linked to the zeta chain, which is the main signaling apparatus that T cells normally use. And we also have what people call second generation designer T cells that have a co-stimulatory signal built into it as well. So it's basically a little caffeine for the designer T cells, gets them working a little better. So this confers what we hope will be exquisite specificity for KIT-positive tumors. Um, again, it allows the T cells using this chimeric antigen receptor to bind to KIT-positive tumors, and this leads to T cell activation and then destruction, hopefully, of the tumor cells. And uh, just two data slides to show you what we've done so far. This is a flow cytometry histogram. So the red curve is showing you our negative control. So this is the expression level of the chimeric antigen receptor. And this is a negative control, so this is essentially zero expression. 
And the blue, the blue curve is showing you expression um, in murine or mouse designer T cells. So we're able to get this expressed in the majority of T cells that we activate and transduce. So we can make them. Now the next question is, do they work? So we did an experiment where we took um, kit tumor cells, um, generously provided by Dr. Fletcher, and we labeled them with a green dye called CFSE. And so we look at the amount of decrease in the dye within the test tube, if you will, to see how much tumor killing occurred. And so this is our negative control. So this is basically green tumor cells with no designer T cells. So this is your baseline level of green fluorescence. When we mix the designer T cells with kit positive tumors, you see a statistically significant drop off in the level of fluorescence. So this tells us that we are in fact able to get specific tumor killing using these designer T cells. Um, we've also demonstrated that we can get T cell proliferation and cytokine production. And we've also uh, done simple counting experiments where we count the number of tumor cells after this assay. And we've confirmed that the designer T cells can in fact um, kill the kit positive tumors. And another negative control in this experiment is we mixed the designer T cells with tumors with a GIST cell line that did not express kit and there was no killing relative to the control. So in summary, the patterns of metastatic disease depend more on the primary tumor site and histology than what we do or do not do as surgeons. Careful patient selection and disease biology assessment are crucial for successful, successful outcomes. And management of sarcoma metastases must be carried out in a multidisciplinary fashion. And the most important take home message is that most patients are not candidates for surgical resection. And we need better therapeutic options for these patients. And I'd like to thank the Kristen Ann Carr Fund for being a part of that. Thank you.